And now let's go to kids. Yeah, let's talk about children with with tachypnea. Yeah, so a subset of, uh, first of all, we talked about what's normal. You have to know kind of what's normal and the age of the child that you're looking at. And then we'll talk about some specific things that could be going on. So for the neonate, mm, neonatal tachypnea, they already are tachypnic. So to think that they go beyond (laughs) is a little bit worrisome. But certainly these are things that are pretty unique to the neonatal scenario that you'd want to think about. Congenital heart disease would be pretty high on that list. But could they have some kind of aspiration? Could it be a pneumothorax, God forbid. Could it be a tracheoesophageal fistula is something associated with their eating that's causing this increased uh, tachypnea? Could it be a hernia of some kind? Or do they have an infection that's causing it? Inborn errors of metabolism, that could also be uh, right. uh, something that's on the list. So Test- testable too. Yeah, there's some unique things on this list that you have to think about in the neonates that this is a manifestation of a structural problem, et cetera, that's manifesting with tachypnea or and abnormal brand, and a brand breathing. New person. And mm-hmm. a brand new person. So approaching that um, baby with tachypnea, you know, you want, obviously, if they're unwell, they're going to be admitted and we're going to go that way. I like the way they say, not acutely unwell. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> and, you know, do they look <laughs> otherwise normal? Is, are they gaining weight? This is British, it's, by, this by, is by the spelling. I can see a British, you know, not acutely unwell. Not acutely unwell. Yes. Um, what is their pulse ox? You can get a pulse ox on a baby. What does that look like? Are they actually hypoxic? What does a chest x-ray look like? Mm. What do we know about their birth history? Have they had already, a lot of these kids, you know, these days have already had, you know, know, ultrasounds of their hearts in utero. So right. some of these things are already known, but you want to think about, you know, whether it's cardiac, whether it's respiratory, et cetera. And you're probably going to need help if they really do have one well, of these, these teeny tiny kids too. These it's t- not uncommon yeah. where it's like, oh, woo. Yeah. Yeah. Then you get into congenital heart disease. And of course, tachypnea or dyspnea or the pr- problems with feeding are often first signs. And yeah. so, you know, these are complicated things and they present in certain ways. We all remember that this there was a time that we knew all these things. And for people who work in children's hospitals, they, they are very familiar with these things. So how are they presenting? Are they blue? Are they in shock? Are they in CHF? Do they have poor feeding? Do they have fussiness? Um, you know, certainly the cyanosis is, is very classic. And then look mm-hmm. at these other signs that could be going on. Do they also have extreme tachycardia? Do they also look very, very pale? What are their pulses like? What are their vital signs like? Do they have rawls? Do they have a big liver? I mean, all of these things can also clue you into what's going on. And then if you go to the far right of this slide, you look down all the scary diagnoses Oof. that these could be. Could it be a, Could it be anything from aortic stenosis or, co- or co- coarc to a tetralogy of Fallot, truncus arteriosus? Oh, there's a lot of things that are on this list that we often, when we're looking at the baby, we don't know what's going on in the right. inside. That's going to take an echo and other studies, but what we see is the cyanosis. We yeah, and I tell you, this, is, this table is probably very useful on the exam. This is something you may want to flag because they may give you a you know, two-week-old who gets very sweaty when they feed, and they're going to want you to recognize that that may be heart failure in a brand new baby, um, and then you can go over to the list of things it might be, but at least this, this will give you a way to focus because I don't think most of us are familiar with this as a routine thing by any stretch of the imagination. So this table, I think, is very helpful in getting you at least to a category of yeah. things. Good for your reference. In terms of tetralogy of flow, one of the more common congenital heart disorders that we can come across, remember that there are positions that can help them in terms of breathing. So putting them in this squatting sort of knee chest position can help increase the systemic vascular resistance and it help reduce that right to left shunt that's happening. Um, they want You want to put oxygen on them and maybe even CPAP if they'll mm-hmm. tolerate it can be um, helpful too. And then you want to kind of calm them down. Don't yeah. have them you know, crying. It's, it's not that easy. It's going to take a parent. It right. Have, um, have the parent hold them. Yeah. Yeah. And even to the point that you might need to give them some sedation to kind of slow all this down and slow the work that their heart and their lungs are doing mm-hmm. to try to get everything kind of under control, even to the point of giving them a beta blocker. And again, yeah. you're not doing this in isolation. You're asking for help at this right. point because this is someone that you're worried about. And they may already know that they have this congenital heart disease when and you're they usually do, right? in crisis. Yeah. Exactly. They usually do, which is which one of those things is like, oh, damn, you know, I, yeah. I, I switched the shift and here's the yeah. tet kid that I'm not exactly sure what to do. So this is this is the approach. Yeah, this is the approach. And then sometimes volume expansion, increasing that preload can be helpful as well. And if they're really, really acidotic, do you want to get IV bicarb on board? But again, that's going to mess with their fluid status and you're not going to do these things in isolation. Mm-hmm. But you need to know that these are options. Yeah, but and oxygen calming and knee chest, you can do. And actually that's often enough to get them chilled enough to let to get the, the, the cardiologist involved and the pediatric people are there and yeah. it gets them kind of mellowed out of it. That's right. 
So what about a little bit of an older child? So let's move on past the neonate. We're not talking about congenital heart dis, you know, uh, disorders. We're talking more about the bronchiolitis, the pneumonia. Mm -hmm. um, do they have now, is this a new diagnosis of asthma? Could they be having some late onset cardiac failure for some reason that they had some sort of benign murmur, but now because they're growing and because there might be something else going on, they're or there's tipped myocarditis, over. myocarditis, right? Or myocarditis, yeah. Is it something like an inhaled foreign body with a history yeah. that might be a mystery, but they're, they're manifesting with this tachypnea and you're trying to figure it figure it out could it be something like aspiration so as you walk through this list you're like okay there are other clues here to give me an idea of what's going on but these are some possibilities in the older kid yeah it's a kind of a nice sort of list of things to kind of look at here and i think most of us know this is just a, a nice reminder yeah. to have so that's sort of the approach to tachypnea dyspnea in general and in children and little guys um, let's talk we're going to move to a new category